Hi, I'm Jay Rawat. I recently completed the John Muir Trail from August 11 to August 30, 2021 with some of my friends. This presentation is a summary of that experience, what we saw, some of the learnings, and also some pictures of the incredible beauty that we saw. So let's start with the basics. What is through hiking? GMT is known as a through hike trail. What does that mean? So here are some examples of the through hiking trails in the US. Uh, the PCT or the Pacific Crest Trail, that's 2,600 miles, takes about six months. Likewise, the Appalachian Trail or AT uh, also takes almost six months to do. Comparatively, the John Muir Trail that we did is a mere 211 miles. I know that's a lot, but compared to some of these other trails, that's not quite as impressive. <laughs> um, so through hikes are not a loop. It's typically not a guided trek, requires a lot of planning. Uh, we thought that by doing the JMT, uh, you know, we, it was a big deal, but then we met many people on the trail who had done the entire PCT. We met many young girls who were doing it alone. We met little kids. We actually met a family who was hiking the JMT with uh, their 10 and 12 year old kids. So it was really a humbling experience for us. All right, so let's talk about the planning. As I said, the planning is very important for this trek. Uh, the first important foremost is training. My philosophy is that when you're doing a hard trek, you should still be able to enjoy it. It should not be a torture. It should not be about somehow finishing the trek because it's really all about enjoying the journey and not about reaching the destination every day. So how did I train? Well, of course, um, we did a lot of hiking with increasingly heavy backpack. And what I did was while I was hiking, I kind of paid attention to which of my muscles were weak, which muscles were aching the next day. And then I focused on strength training to strengthen those muscles. Uh, and then of course I did a lot of uh, uh, cross training as well, uh, primarily through biking and a lot of stretching uh, as well. Uh, it also helps you calibrate your speed when you're training. So you kind of have an idea of how many miles can you really do every day? And that helps you figure out the itinerary. Uh, food. Food can actually add a lot of weight. So you need to choose your food very carefully. You have to select food that is calorie dense and also nutritious. You have to decide how many calories you are gonna need every day. Um, you also want to add maybe some comfort food, a diversity of food so you don't get bored. Uh, and of course, you know, for a trail like JMT, you cannot carry the food for the entire 20 days. So what we had to do was we had to uh, research the food resupply options and we shipped our food in these buckets that you can see in the picture, and we shipped the food um, ahead of time to certain food resupply points, and we picked up our food from there. Uh, on an average, I was carrying about one and a half pounds of food per day. The next one is gear. Again, very meticulously, I, I had to plan all of my gear, uh, taking everything that I will need, but nothing more. Because again, um, you have to make sure that you're not carrying extra because that's going to add weight. And if you forget something and you need it, then that's a problem because you're not going to get it on the trail. So it requires a lot of planning. A trial hike is very useful. Uh, backpack and shoe selection is critical. That Those are the things that you want to dial down first as soon as possible. And it's really interesting to see that when you have to carry everything on your back, how little you need. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, carrying on on the, on, the, on the same theme, you have to figure out how much weight you want to carry. Uh, you can go with what's known as an ultralight option, which can be fairly expensive and that's very minimalistic as well. Uh, so you, you let go of some of the comfort and it'll be more expensive as I said, versus you, know, you can try to go lightweight, uh, but uh, that means that still you are carrying more weight than you would be if you went ultralight. Uh, Either way, you have to be ruthless. Every gram counts. I had created detailed spreadsheets for both my food as well as gear, knowing exactly how much weight I was going to carry. And down to the last gram, I knew how much everything weighed. The next one is itinerary. How many days will it take? You know, how, how are you going to get there? How are you going to come back from there? Uh, how are you going to navigate on the trail? How are you going to figure out 
um, where the water sources are, right? where the potential exit points are. Uh, so all of those things need to be really well understood ahead of time and well researched uh, because you're not going to get a phone signal on the trail. Uh, you also have to plan for emergencies. So we carried a satellite device with us. Uh, this is a Garmin device that we carried. And uh, this device allowed us to stay in contact via text messages. It also has an SOS option. So you can press the SOS button and then you know, someone will come to rescue you. Uh, in fact, there was an interesting um, incident that happened uh, at one of the campsites uh, when we had pitched our tents, we suddenly saw a helicopter hovering over us. I couldn't quite figure out what the helicopter was saying, but it was a rescue helicopter. Uh, after some time, the helicopter went away. And later on, we found out that someone had accidentally pressed their SOS button on, on, on one of these devices. And therefore, the helicopter had come for their rescue. Later on, the confusion was cleared that it was an accident and the helicopter went away. But it was both unnerving as well as reassuring to know uh, <laughs> that uh, we can indeed get help if you need to. Uh, team, you know, are you going to do it alone? Many people do it alone, you know, just uh, soul searching exercise for them. Or are you going to do it with a team? You know, I really like to go with a team. Uh, I don't like to spend these many days alone. Uh, team dynamics are very important. Can you really spend 20 days together and still remain friends? <laughs> right? Uh, are you compatible? What about your physical fitness? Uh, are you going to be all traveling at the same speed or different speeds? Uh, are they all going to be committed to the entire trek and so on? You know, so it's very important to find the right team if you're going to do it in a team. And the last but not least uh, part is the expenses. Uh, it's easy to spend thousands of dollars on the gear and food and everything else. So you really have to evaluate the cost benefit. Uh, for example, one of the things that we had to evaluate was uh, there are no good resupply options for the last 10 days. The only option was to get a mule resupply on the trail but that was almost $850. As a team, we decided that we are gonna go for that option rather than carrying 10 days of food, uh, but there are six of us, so or seven of us, so we are able to divide up that cost and it, it was workable. But these are the kinds of decisions that you have to take uh, when you're on the trail. Um, so as I said, you really have to figure out how much stuff you really need. <laughs> when you first create your list, this is what it's gonna look like. Now, a question that is often asked, in fact, the most often asked question is, why do you do that? You know, why go in the wilderness for 20 days? What's the point of it? So for me, there are four reasons. The first is, life is about gaining new experiences. This is a great way to do something different. One of my favorite quotes is, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Second reason is getting out of the comfort zone. It's deeply fulfilling to do something which really challenges you and you're able to accomplish it. And that really gives you immense satisfaction. The third reason is to disconnect from the world. And my philosophy is that disconnecting from the world will in fact help you reconnect with the world in a totally different way. You know, there is no Wi-Fi out there, but you find a much better connection. And the last reason is that this is really the only way to truly see and experience the wonders nature has to offer. All right, so now let's talk about GMT. GMT passes through some of the best national parks and forests in the United States. The trail can be done southbound or northbound. Uh, you can do the full trail or you can do it in sections. Southbound option is the most popular option and it's really hard to get a permit for it. It's based on a lottery system. Uh, and uh, based on some of the blogs I read, the chances of getting that lottery is only about 3%. So we really got lucky. Most of the trail, as you can see, is above 8,000 feet. Uh, so the, if you do it southbound, it allows for altitude acclimation. Uh, and what we realized was that while we are training at the ground level, when you're climbing, let's say 2,000 or 3,000 feet at the ground level, it's very different then climbing 2000 feet at a high altitude with a heavy backpack. It, it is much, much harder when there is lack of oxygen, oxygen and you are at a high altitude. Uh, as you can see in the picture, we crossed 11 mountain passes with increasing difficulty. 
for the most part, what we did was we tried to break up the climbs between two days. So the harder mountain passes, instead of trying to tackle the entire pass in one day, we would camp somewhere in the middle of the pass, uh, middle of the climb, and then we will finish the climb the next day. Uh, fortunately, you actually get trail legs, so it gets easier, not harder, as the days go by. Um, and I recorded a 3D overview of the trail, um, which is also in the same blog uh, that you're seeing this video on, or you can search for the 3D overview video on YouTube, if you're seeing this on YouTube. All right, so quick stats from our track. It was a 20 day track. We covered 230 miles, which is about 370 kilometers total distance. Although the trail itself is only 211 miles. We added a trip to Half Dome. And then of course the trail ends on the top of Mount Whitney and you still have to climb down 11 miles to get to Whitney Portal, which is the exit point. So but once you add the detour as well as the climb down for Mount Whitney, the total distance ended up being 230 miles. We climbed over 50,000 feet. Just to put that in perspective, that's 1.7 times the height of Mount Everest. That's crazy. And our daily stats on an average were, you know, 11.5 miles a day with 2,500 feet of climbing and 2,300 feet of descending with an average of about 40 pound or 20 kilo kilogram backpack. So that's like covering a half marathon distance every day while going up and down the mountains, carrying a heavy check-in back. Of course, it's really hard, but you have to follow some trail etiquettes and make sure that you're always encouraging your fellow hikers. <laughs> Here's my proof of completion. For a few years now, I've been doing a headstand at the end of all the adventures, any adventure uh, activity that I do, uh, including Everest Base Camp or marathons or ultra marathons. Um, I did a bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles, et cetera. So at the end of any of those activities, I would end the activity with a headstand to celebrate. I have quite a good collection of headstands now. This is at the type of top of Mount Whitney. Uh, as you can see, the surface is quite uneven and at 14,500 feet, uh, it was really hard to do this headstand. All right, so let's quickly talk about the team. Uh, as I said, we were seven people uh, from left to right. Uh, it's Samir Palnatkar, uh, Meenal Patwardhan, Anu Palnatkar, Samir's wife, uh, myself, Jai Rawat in the middle, uh, Ankur Zindal, who is the tallest guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the picture, Arun Kumar, and Ashutosh Chauhan. So this was a team. Arun unfortunately had to leave uh, the trek after six days because uh, of some medical reasons at home. Uh, so it was really unfortunate to see him go. Uh, he was in fact uh, the most experienced person in the group. Uh, Except for him, none of us had actually done a through backpacking trip earlier. Uh, so we were all novices and we were all basically doing it for the first time. Uh, Meenal was the least experienced. She had never done a multi-day trek, even a guided one. Uh, so for her, you know, it was like uh, picking up running and the first event she's doing is a full marathon. You know? So she just, this is her very first um, multi-day trek and she started with JMT. So that was incredible. All right, so let's look at some pictures from JMT. This is a picture when we were on our way to Half Dome. What you're seeing here is Vernal Falls. Uh, this is also the same picture that's in my background image. Uh, so this is from Yosemite Valley. I have an incredible view. Yosemite, every time I go there, it just feels magical. And every time I feel that I should come here more, more often, uh, but I really don't do that as often as I should. Um, as I said, we did a side trip to Half Dome. And those of you who are not familiar with the Half Dome, the last part, I think about 400 feet or so, is incredibly steep. It's 45 to 60 degree incline, which you cannot climb. So what the park service has done is they have fastened these metal cables and wooden boards, which are nailed to the granite. And so what you do is you use those cables to pull yourself up 
And then every once in a while you get the wooden board and you can rest your feet on that wooden board. And that gives you a little bit of traction because the granite can be slippery. Uh, it can be quite scary. There are people who just freeze sometimes. Uh, in fact, most of the time there is a traffic jam here because people just get scared and they start going very slow or they just stop. And this is the same route that you have to take when you're, you know, whether you're going up or coming down. So there can be quite a bit of traffic jam at times. Well, so this is me on top of Half Dome. Unfortunately, not everyone from our group could make it to the top because we could see some threatening thunderstorm clouds looming in the sky. You can see behind me, there are some black clouds that are coming up. And Half Dome is the last place you want to be in a thunderstorm because it is the tallest uh, peak uh, around and it's most likely to attract lightning. Uh, Half Dome, I think, is around 8,800 feet. So if you're stuck there in a thunderstorm, you cannot even go down because the metal cables are not safe in a lightning storm. Uh, and granite will be slippery if it is wet. So you may get stuck for a very long time in a scary spot. Uh, you know, we had also learned how to spot potential thunderstorms by looking at the clouds, uh, counting the seconds between seeing lightning versus hearing the thunder, et cetera. So we learned all those things to understand how to assess the threat. Uh, so because we were seeing these black clouds uh, looming up in the sky, uh, the three of us, uh, myself, Arun and Ashutosh, we were able to get on top of Half Dome because we were ahead of the pack. Uh, the rest of the group, when they arrived at the base, uh, they decided that it was not safe to climb the last section and they turned back from there, uh, which was the right decision. The landscape changed every few miles. It looked like we were in a different place altogether. Uh, of course, being in California and the last many, many years, California has been uh, getting devastated by wildfires. So we were going to see many, many areas uh, where there are burnt forests. Interestingly, though, even the burnt forest looked eerily beautiful. And although California has been in drought, I was, and I was kind of scared that we may not see any greenery at all, we did see plenty of greenery, lush forests and meadows. Uh, oftentimes we are traveling on this inhospitable terrain. We saw endless mountains and uh, scary climbs, uh, really intimidating when you look at those vertical cliffs, how are you gonna climb them? Uh, the, the terrain was not very good. But then other times we saw green endless meadows and it was just magical to see that site. We also saw dozens of really breathtaking alpine lakes. So alpine lakes are lakes which are at roughly 10,000 feet or above. Uh, so we saw dozens of such lakes and these lakes really were the highlights of the entire track because they were just so incredibly beautiful. There are just a few pictures of some of the lakes that we saw and you can see these lakes really reflected all the scenery around them perfectly. And, and you know we saw them every day almost, but every time we saw it, it was just as magical as if we are seeing it for the first time. While we saw all those reflections in the lakes, we had plenty of time to reflect ourselves. Uh, we got plenty of time to ourselves uh, where we could sit down and really um, you know think about uh, life in general. So that was really a good part of the trek where we really got, a, got, got, got some time to enjoy uh, with the team, with the, with the friends, but as well as by ourselves. Saw so those lakes, um, I actually braved those lakes uh, and, and had a dip to, <laughs> uh, to rinse myself and to rinse our clothes as well. Uh, the water was really cold, really, really cold, as you can imagine, at, um, you know, it was freezing water so not everyone was brave enough to take a dip, but uh, you know I did try to do that every chance I got. Um, I'm not a swimmer, and that created a problem once because what happened was while I was taking that dip, uh, one of my sandals somehow floated away in the lake. And I was wondering what to do about that when I saw this other hiker and I requested him to see if he knew how to swim. So 
So he is now swimming in this frigid lake to retrieve my sandal. What an incredibly kind thing to do. But what we found was that people on the trail are incredibly helpful. There you go. So that's what we call trail magic. You know, you meet people who are completely unknown, but they really go out of their way to help you. All right, continuing on with the pictures, we saw many interesting and unusual formations. Uh, so this is the Devil's Postpile National Monument. These columns are hexagonal columns and they were created by cooling lava flow. Uh, the picture that you see on the top are the ends of these columns. So you can see these are almost nearly perfectly hexagonal and these are completely natural made. So it was a very interesting site. Uh, this is near Mammoth Lake, and this is one of those places where we saw a lot of people because you can actually get to this place by car as well. Here is another interesting geograph geographical formation. What you're seeing here on the top are the avalanche chutes. So when the avalanche happened, it created these chutes, but you can see a trim line where the avalanche just stopped. And this trim line represents the amount of ice that was there in the valley at the time the avalanche happened. Of course, now the ice is all gone, but the trim line is still there. So you can really see the level of ice that was there. It's a very fascinating thing uh, when, you, when you look at it. And I would say unusual was not very unusual. So you can see in the first picture, the trees that are uh, bent over and, and growing at uh, you know, interesting angles to account for the slopes. Uh, you can see the interesting um, cloud formations in the sky, interesting trees. Um, uh, the picture over here is um, uh, the ceiling from Muir Hut on top of Muir Pass. Uh, you can see these trees, they look like infinity. Looks like flowers are growing out of uh, rocks. Uh, looks like the here the water is on fire. And of course, we saw many other forests that were burnt trees, but they look beautiful somehow. We also saw some unbelievable sunrises and sunsets and night skies. Every morning, every evening was magical. So here are some pictures of the kinds of sunsets and sunrises we saw. Uh, this is close to Tuolumne Meadows when we started um, next day from Tuolumne Meadows in the morning. Here, this is one of my favorite pictures. You can see a single ray of the sun filtering through the forest and it's lighting up just a patch of grass. It looks like almost that patch of grass is on fire. It was just an incredible sight. Here, uh, we are at Lake Evolution, and you can see the color change on either side of me. The reason for this color change is because the lake on the left is reflecting the mountains around it and the lake on the right is not. Although they are connected, they look like they are two different colors. Uh, the area around here, including the mountain peaks, is named after prominent figures in evolution biology. So that's why it's called Lake Evolution. Um, but there are also like mountain peaks, which are named after Darwin. And there are other peaks that are named after um, Heckel, Huxley, Spencer, etc. It's a very, very beautiful area. And the sunrises and sunsets were simply mesmerizing every day. Uh, as the sun, setting sun or the rising sun started hitting the top of the mountains, you could see the color of the mountain changed. So you can see the mountains started glowing, the trees started glowing, the sky would start glowing. It was just amazing to see that. And here is a picture of a night sky where you can see the Milky Way. Um, I was particularly proud of this picture when I managed to take this picture, you know, just using my uh, smartphone. Uh, so every day, again, the night sky was just incredible. Now, one of the things that JMT has done such a fantastic job of is to make sure that the trail remains pristine and it remains just as beautiful for generations to come. And the way to do that is to follow what's called leave no trace or LNT principle. You want to make sure that once you pass through JMT, you do not leave any trace behind. And we traveled 230 miles. We did not see a single piece of trash on the trail. So the guidelines are that you have to camp at least 100 feet away from water. 
or you know if you have to go poop or um, uh, you have to pee you have to make sure that you are not polluting any of the water sources you have to store your food properly carry out all the trash you cannot leave any trash behind um, and either you bury your poop uh, in most places you just dig a hole and bury your poop uh, and there are some places where you even have to carry your poop uh, with you there's a famous quote by john muir that the mountains are calling and i must go what you don't want is the mountains to tell each other talk to each other and say hey you know why should we call them why did we call them so that's not what you want you want to make sure that the mountains are happy that you are there you visited them but you did not leave any trace behind so proper food storage is very essential because if you do not store your food properly the bears or other animals can get to the food and not only are you going to lose your food those animals will have they may end up losing their lives not because your food is toxic but because you have taught them to get the food the wrong way and what happens is let's say if a bear is able to get the food from humans that bear is going to get more aggressive they are going to learn that this is the way to get food and they may even teach that wrong behavior to their kids and the park service may have to sometimes put down generations of bears so that they can unlearn that behavior so you have to be very careful and make sure that you are storing your food properly and you are making sure that no animal is able to get to your food and they continue to get their food the natural way uh, i talked a little bit about uh, digging holes um, <laughs> for pooping so here is an example of the type of hole you have to dig Uh, you have to use a trowel, dig a hole, uh, and then um, cover it up again after you're done with the business. If you use toilet paper, then you have to carry those toilet papers with you. You cannot bury the toilet papers. Although that's one thing that we did see at times, we saw uh, in some places we saw some toilet papers that are buried, which is not nice. Uh, but the policy is that you are supposed to carry toilet paper back with you. What we did was we ended up using a portable bidet instead. Uh, and in the mount witty zone where uh, the, the soil really is very thin and you cannot really dig holes there uh, you have to use a wag bag uh, and then carry your poop with you i know it sounds gross but this is how we can protect the area and we can make sure that that area remains available for our kids and their kids and their kids to enjoy you know and if you really want showers and toilet paper uh you have to figure out an exit point and and go to a point where you can actually find those uh, luxuries all right let's let's talk about how we lived so daily routine was to wake up early in the morning you would wake up around 4:30 am while it was still dark unfortunately that was also typically the coldest time of the day so often times you were waking up when it was dark and it was cold it was in you know maybe early 40s um but it also meant that we were spending less time in the sun so we were able to reach a destination uh, without spending too much time in the sun uh it was really hard to wake up that early and uh, to do all the cooking and packing etc in, in 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 the in the dark uh, so in the morning what we did was we did our morning rituals we cooked and ate breakfast uh, some people who were in the slower group they would also cook their lunch and carry with them uh me and ashutosh we typically were able to reach the destination by 12 31 o'clock so we would typically reach a destination and cook a lunch there so that was our morning routine uh samir had created a, a morning selfie routine so every day before we left we took a selfie which was nice uh typically we were able to get on the trail by about 6:30 a.m. Uh, so it used to take us between 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours to get ready and packed up Uh, for a group of 6 or 7 you know that was the best we could do and then of course we would have a long day on the trail 5 uh, 6 hours on an average uh, that's what it took me at least on a daily basis uh, we covered brutal climbs uh, seemed like never ending climbs and even the descents were not easy in fact sometimes the descents were harder than the climb because it really is hard on your knees and it's uh, much easier to twist your ankle when you're coming down uh, there are some sections where we encountered these thorny bushes and narrow trails so you can see the trail is really narrow and these bushes actually have thorns 
And fortunately, we are wearing long pants. Otherwise, they can really scrape against your legs and, and injure them. Uh, the terrain was inhospitable at times. We were walking on these rocks. Uh, and again, you know, it's, it does not give you any stable footing. They're very easy to twist your ankles. In fact, uh, I did twist my ankle, uh, ankle once and I was limping for a few days, could not even walk properly. Uh, and, uh, you know, then at one point I just decided to ignore it. I just took some Advil in the morning, tied a sport bandage around my ankle uh, and, and carried on. But then we also saw some really fairy tale paths, paths that were really smooth and very nice and flat. Um, we saw some streams and waterfalls. And I tell my kids that this is the right way to see live streaming. You know, you don't see live streaming on um, Facebook and YouTube. You want to see live streams, go to the mountains. We saw incredible lakes. We saw mountains and valleys. Um, and you know, in normal years, the streams and rivers will have a lot more water. And you really have to learn how to cross the, the water properly. It's called fording a river. And it can be quite dangerous when the currents are high. But because this was a drought year, we did not encounter any such high currents. Uh, another interesting story that happened during the, during the trail um, is uh, we found out that there was a person who was hiking the JMT and two of his kids flew from the East Coast. They climbed the Selden Pass with, I think, like a 50 pound backpack uh, to surprise their dad. And they met their dad on top of the pass and they're carrying grills and burgers. So they actually made fresh burger, beer on the top of Selden Pass. They gave them to their dad and of course, to anyone else who was passing by. Unfortunately, we missed that by just one day. But what an incredible story. I've told that story to my kids many times now. <laughs> of course, we took time to stop and enjoy the views. It was all about enjoying the journey and not just the destination. So anytime we saw a beautiful site, we would just stop and um, soak in the views and admire the views. And then when we reached our destination in the evening, we pitched our tents, we set up our water and kitchen, so you can see uh, here that we have some gravity filters. What we did was uh, the three of us in the group, we had these uh, gravity filters as well. So these are uh, water bags that could take four to six liters of water. And then you can attach a filter to it. And it almost acts like a faucet. So anytime you need water, you just unclip it um, and then you can, the, the water starts flowing. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, now, one of the nights, uh, when we were sleeping, we heard some cowbells and we heard some animals galloping sounds at night. And we were quite scared. We weren't quite sure what was going on. No one, no one had the courage to actually step out and see what was going on. Uh, next morning, when we got back on the trail, we found that there were um, many mule droppings, fresh mule droppings on the trail. So it looks like maybe there was a mule train that was passing by and it wasn't anything dangerous or interesting. Um, but that night we actually were kind of scared and didn't know what was going on. Anyhow, uh, so after reaching our destination, we would typically soak our feet for recovery. Uh, we stretched. I had this little foam that I bought. Um, so that was used by everyone to stretch. Uh, and uh, of course, then we enjoyed a dinner together. The Around four o'clock, I designated that as chai o'clock. So I would have my tea at around four o'clock. Uh, whenever possible, we also played some games, uh, dumb charades, cards, etc. So that was, uh, you know, fun time. Uh, many of the days we were just simply tired and didn't have enough time to play games. Uh, but you know, some days we reached quite early and we were able to really enjoy our time. And then we went to bed around uh, seven to eight p.m. So as it started getting dark, we would be in our tents. And finally, let me just share some fun pictures with you. So I tend to be a little bit goofy on the trail. I like to just, you know, climb different structures and just, um, you know, have fun. Uh, so here I am hanging upside down from a bridge. Uh, here, you know, after taking a dip in the Alpine Lake and after rinsing my clothes, I'm drying myself as well as my clothes. 
recharging my soul as well as my battery pack. So you can see the solar panel. Someone took this picture. You know what's great about being in nature? That all the bathrooms were gender neutral. <laughs> Here uh, is a picture on top of the Muir Pass. Uh, the structure is called the Muir Hut. Uh, interesting thing happened here inside the hut. At one point, there were three girls who were crying for different reasons. You know, one girl uh, who uh, had a huge toothache and she was looking for a way to exit and get to a dentist. Um, another lady, she was an older lady and she was just overwhelmed uh, by the Muir Pass. And then Meenal, who was also very exhausted and um, also overwhelmed because she was able to complete the Muir Pass. Um, I found this uh, set of horns uh, and um, again, you know, just posing with the horns. Uh, Mather Pass, uh, which is almost uh, 12,000 feet as well. Uh, there was another hard climb. This is Glen Pass, again, a 12,000 foot uh, pass. Uh, the picture here looks, makes, makes it look like as if I'm either falling or I'm trying to climb up the, 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 the rocks. Uh, but the reality is that my feet are in fact on stable ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is us on Forester Pass. This was the highest pass uh, that we crossed, except for Mount Whitney, of course. Um, so all of us were very excited and uh, happy that we had conquered this. This is us on top of Mount Whitney, which is at 14,500 feet. It was actually quite cold. Uh, we had created these special t-shirts just to wear on top of Mount Whitney. In fact, that's the same t-shirt that I'm wearing right now. Uh, so we took off our jackets just to get this picture, um, but it was it was just an incredible, incredible feeling. So what we did was we planned our ascent to Mount Whitney in such a way so that we would reach the top at sunrise. So we caught the sunrise on top of Mount Whitney, and that turned out to be such a great decision because it was it was beautiful without beyond words. Here is a picture from top of Mount Whitney. You have to be there to really experience that. Uh, you know, no pictures can do justice. Now, as I said, JMT is officially complete on top of Mount Whitney, but we still had to descend 11 miles and over 6,000 feet to get to Whitney Portal, which is where the exit point is. And again, you can see the trail engineers have done such a phenomenal job of carving out the trail in the middle of all these rocks. Uh, we had stored our backpacks uh, at the trail crest. So there are two ways to climb, uh, climb Whitney. You can come from the Guitar Lake route, which is what we did uh, to climb, or you can come from Whitney Portal. So we climbed from the Guitar Lake and we went down to Whitney Portal. This is the intersection point. Uh, so what we did was we stored our backpacks here and the last section we just climbed with our day pack, which just had water and some snacks. So we retrieved our backpacks here. And then we went on to the Whitney portal. From there, we caught a shuttle, went to Lone Pine. At Whitney portal, we also ate some burgers. Finally, we had some good food. We went to Lone Pine, uh, where we had booked a hotel for the night stay. And we finally hung up our boots. And we were incredibly lucky because just as we reached Lone Pine, we learned that next day, all the national forests in California were gonna be closed down because of all the fires that were burning. So we just managed to complete our hike just in time. If we had been late by two days, we would have been evacuated and we would not have completed our journey. So we're very lucky that we were able to complete it. And this is me before the hike and just as I re-emerged back into civilization at Viti Boro. <laughs> All right. So to end this presentation, let me just share a couple of learnings from this, from this entire track. So the first learning is that how little you need in your life. This is all the gear that I carried, that's it. So again, as I said, once you have to carry everything on your own back, you, get, you end up being very, very selective. In real life, I have a five bedroom house and I still run out of space. But you realize that what you need versus what you want are two very different things. So it really made me realize that 
how much excess baggage I carry on a day-to-day -day basis. The second learning is that you are really not as essential as you think. Right? We are gone for 20 plus days and the world was just fine without us. We are cut off from the world. The world didn't really care. Yeah, of course, our close family cared about where we were and about our well-being. But by and large, you know, I think we give too much importance to ourselves. Um, you know, you, the, the, we, we are not as important as we think we are. Uh, and the third learning was that you should take time to disconnect. Don't let the devices own you. A, a quick, interesting experience that I had along the trail was in the first two or three days, I was compulsively taking out my, my cell phone and checking for any messages or connectivity. Although I knew that there is no connectivity, but I was still checking my phone um, every couple of hours in the, in the beginning. But after two or three days, I gave up because I knew there was no connectivity. And then I was really in the present. I was really enjoying what was around me and not thinking about you know, what messages or emails I may be receiving from someone else. So really being in present, really being able to enjoy the surroundings and not worry about anything else, that was an incredible experience. And then at the top of Mount Whitney, when I did get some signals and I could hear all the messages loading in the background, I didn't care. I did not care about reading any of those messages or emails until the next day. So from compulsively checking my phone for messages and emails to being in the present, to getting to a point where although all those messages were there, I did not care about opening WhatsApp or Facebook or my email because I knew that it could wait. So that was a transformation that I was really happy about. Hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. If you have already done JMT, this may have reminded you of some of the sites and experience that you had yourself. If you have not done it, I would encourage you to go out outdoors. You don't have to do JMT. You can do a smaller trek, shorter trek, but just go outdoors, enjoy the nature. And thank you for watching this presentation.